So um, here's a simulation that shows much a similar thing, um, but kind of shows the idea that different masses of objects bend space-time more or less. So here we've got our, our more massive orange star and then a few less massive yellow stars. And when we look at them as if they're embedded in space-time, the orange star is uh, deforming space more than the yellow stars. And then here, this invisible object, we didn't even see it when we were looking in the, uh, um, in the visible range. This is a black hole where space-time is bent infinitely. All right, so all mass bends space-time, um, not just black holes, but all massive objects. It's the most apparent for very massive objects like stars. So the sun, which is a you know, middle range mass star, bends space-time um, a bit, right? And causes the earth to orbit around it for that reason. A white dwarf, which is a stellar remnant of stars that are more massive than our sun, it's more massive than the sun, so it bends space-time more than the sun does. And then a neutron star, which is the remnant of a dead star that's even more massive than a white dwarf, distorts space-time even more than that. So the idea is that the more mass you have, the more you're distorting and bending space-time. Um, and black holes just take this idea to a, an extreme. So there's a few important um, features on a black hole that we want to discuss. Um, the first is the singularity, which cannot be shown in the diagram because the cone of this bent space-time extends all the way to infinity. And at infinity, that point is where all the mass that was in whatever you know, star collapsed to become a black hole got squeezed. So all that mass is squeezed into one single point called the singularity. So it's you know, way off, infinitely far off the page here. Uh, the other important... Uh, I guess, location for a black hole is the event horizon. So this would be some region of the black hole where an object which passes that point would be trapped. So I want to go into a little bit more detail about the event horizon in particular and what defines where it is around the black hole. All right, and in order to understand this, we have to talk about the idea of escape velocity. So um, the escape velocity is just the initial velocity that you need to escape a massive object and never return. So if we want to, for example, send a space probe into um, you know, deep space, right, far from the Earth, then we need to give it at least the escape velocity it needs to uh, escape the gravitational influence of the Earth. And so to understand escape velocity, um, you can use conservation of energy and some uh, you know, physics of classical mechanics uh, to come up with the escape velocity equation. And it turns out that the equation for escape velocity only depends on the properties of the object you're trying to escape. So in this case, if I have a rocket ship, I'm trying to escape the earth, then only the, the uh, mass and the radius of the earth enter into this escape velocity equation. It actually doesn't matter what the mass of your rocket is to determine that escape velocity. That's because the escape velocity is all about um, escaping that object's gravity, right? And um, so if we know the mass of some object and the radius of some object, then we can use that to calculate its escape velocity. Um, and so the reason we wanna talk about escape velocity is that for a black hole, uh, the very definition of a black hole is that nothing can escape, not even light. So this is what allows us to apply this idea of escape velocity, because what this statement means in terms of our equation is that the escape velocity of a black hole is equal to the speed of light. So if we take our escape velocity equation, we set the velocity equal to the speed of light. And now we can do something like, I don't know, solve for the radius of a black hole based on its mass, because everything else in this equation will be a fundamental universal constant. The speed of light is a constant, which we know. Um, big G is Newton's um, universal gravitational constant, which we know. And so we can just solve for this radius. So this particular special radius is called the Schwarzschild radius, named after uh, the theorist who came up with it. This is basically what you could think of as the point of no return for light, right? Or anything else for that matter. 
Um, and so the event horizon is defined by that size, that radius, the Schwartz child radius. And it, it depends on only the mass of the black hole and some constants. So I want to ask you a few questions. Um, let's suppose that we're plotting um, mass on the x-axis. I should have labeled these axes. Mass on the x-axis and radius on the y-axis. And those are the same for all these four graphs. Which of these would show the relationship between radius, Schwartz child radius, and mass for a black hole? OK, yeah, definitely. So as m goes up, r goes up. So for that reason, we know if M goes up, R cannot go down. So choice B can't be right. So we'll have to throw out choice B. And then as M increases, R has to increase. So that can't be C either. Um, there is another important observation that you point out, which is all of this is constant. So this really looks like, I'm going to try to write here, but it's probably going to be bad. It looks like Y equals MX plus B, where B is equal to zero, right? It looks like y equals mx plus b, but b is 0. Um, m is all this stuff. And so I'll just call that little m here. And then we've got the mass of the black hole and the radius of the black hole. So this is just the equation for a straight line. So that means that choice d is out too, because that's not a straight line. That leaves us only with choice a. All right. Um, if you were thinking that maybe it should look like a parabola because there was a, um, you know, there's a square in the equation, um, I feel you. Uh, but since that's a constant, then it just wraps up into it's it's a constant, right? It's it's not our variable. Our variable is the mass. Okay. So, oops. Get rid of that. All right. So yeah, choice A is the correct relationship between the Schwarzschild radius and the mass. Now I'm going to ask you a similar but different question and let you interpret what it means. Which of the graphs correctly shows the relationship between a black hole's size and its mass? All right, so I see lots of votes for A still, and that's reasonable if you are working under the assumption that size means Schwarzschild radius. But what is the size of a black hole, right? This is why when I talk about the size of a black hole, if I'm talking about its Schwarzschild radius, I'll say so specifically. Um, because in this case, I do not mean that the Schwarzschild radius is the black hole's size. The size of a black hole, the, the physical extent of how much you know, space the mass takes up, that's zero, right? It takes up zero space. Um, so. I would say that the size of a black hole, if you think about not the Schwarzschild radius, but how much space the mass takes up is actually C, because no matter how much mass you stuff into a black hole, it'll still take up zero amount of space. All right, so I guess another way to think about this is when I showed you this picture of the, um, the curved space time for a black hole, that singularity is really the size of the black hole it's just that the event horizon um, has a size of the Schwarzschild radius. But the event horizon isn't some sort of you know, size of the black hole. It only describes one particular point, which is where the escape velocity is equal to the speed of light. That's it. So another way to think about this is that the proper way to draw a black hole is to draw a circle illustrating the event horizon, and then inside of it, draw a dot that represents the singularity. And if you then look at increasing the mass of the black hole, then as you increase the mass by constant amounts, say two solar masses, then the radius will increase by that same amount of, of two, two, I guess, whatever the you know, Schwarzschild radius of the sun is. All right, so uh, evenly spaced masses of black holes would have evenly spaced sizes of event horizon. And um, you know the singularity size of the singularity is zero for all of those. Um, what we can also see from looking at this is that if you have a more massive black hole, then the event horizon is farther away from the singularity. Um, but if you have a, a less massive black hole, the event horizon is quite cl uh, close to the singularity. Okay, 
So what do you think would happen if the sun itself magically collapsed into a black hole? I say magically because like I just said, um, something the mass of our sun could not be a black hole. But if it did, what would happen to the Earth's orbit? All right, so everyone is on the same page. Earth would just continue along its normal orbit. There's nothing special about the gravity of a black hole that's different from the gravity of any other massive object, as long as you're outside of the event horizon, right? Um, so you're really, you know, not in any danger of getting sucked into a black hole until you get very close to that black hole.